Hello everybody, welcome to my video blog. Today we're going to talk about globalization, the different types of globalization we are now going through compared to the past, and what do we do about the disruptions that could derive from it. The uh, globalization is a, is a word that uh, speaks about a large phenomenon that has been changing over time. There was a first globalization that was the result of the drop in transport costs. As transporting things by boat and by train, etc., became cheaper, we saw a lot of trade in merchandising from the colonies to the metropolis, from the periphery to the center, let's say from India to the United Kingdom. Um, countries like India would export raw materials and uh, they would receive in exchange finished products. Countries like the UK would specialize in tr industrial transformation and uh, this industrial transformation will raise the living standards of everybody in the country as the entire product was produced in the country, from researching it to selling it to marketing it to actually working in the factory floor. The second stage of globalization has to do with the job of communication costs. When email, phone, etc. allow people to communicate more cheaply, what we see is that the world becomes slower in a smaller in a different way. We can divide the different stages of the production chain among different places. We can have the designers in one country, the people who sell it in another, the marketing, the industrial production, all of those things in different places. And the trade is not between countries, really is within stages of the value chain. It's not that we exchange raw materials for finished product, it's that each stage in the value chain is done in a different place. So a company like Apple, for example, will buy in China its screens, will do the research and development and marketing in Cupertino, will buy the chips in Taiwan. The communications allow for all that complex production to be coordinated. How is this different? Well, it's different in that each stage of the production chain can be done in the country which more efficiently, more cheaply and with more quality can do that stage. Uh, that exposes workers to global competition as production can be moved to different places and fractures the countries in the sense that some people within a particular country can be in that global value chain and benefit from globalization, other people can get hurt by it. Um, this is very well illustrated by this figure that you can see now from Branko Milanovic on the elephant graph. It's a figure that shows in the horizontal axis the position of everybody occupies in the ranking of the income distribution worldwide and in the vertical axis it shows how over two decades that their income changed. And what you see is in point A, those are the people who saw a big increase in income, 80% increase in income, and the people who are in the 50 or 60 percentile, those are people who benefited hugely from globalization. Those are the middle classes of India and China, for example, that got a huge bump. And you see that everybody to the left of them really benefited from communication. On the right, however, you get point B, which are people who actually didn't benefit from the last 20 years. The people in that position are the Western middle classes. Those are people who actually um, have seen the skills open to global competition and they have actually not really benefited from it. Uh, in point C, you see those who are in the upper reaches, the professional classes, etc., of the income distribution who have really uh, seen a big increase in income through globalization. What you see is fragmentation because within the same country we see those who benefit, those who don't. In the advanced world, in the developing world, basically everybody has benefited. What can we do in the advanced world to avoid this fracture? Well, most of the policies are national. We need skills policies to have everybody prepared to this global competition. We need social policies to make sure nobody loses. We've uh, proposed, for example, earning income tax credits, salary complements, work credits. Um, and at the European level, we can also do something. Uh, social policies are mostly national, but we have a European social pillar that can contribute particularly by investing in skills and helping people have mobility across countries. Programs like Erasmus, programs that allow for the mobility of, of, of social security, particularly through digitalization, would be very useful to accomplish that. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed it.